Well, good morning, everybody. So glad that you're here today. Uh, I hope you've got sermon notes. Um, if you don't, raise your hand and I'll make sure somebody gets them to you. Anybody need sermon notes? It helps. What really helps is in the middle of the week, picking them up and then looking at them and seeing how many different things happen between now and then that it applied to, but you forgot the message, but now you're reading it again and you're remembering, oh, wow, God actually prepared me for Tuesday on Sunday, you know, and, but we, we think it's just one of many things. We watch TV and it just, we get used to just taking stuff in. It means nothing, you know, there, it's there to entertain us. We like, you know, stories and we like all the different story plots and all that kind of stuff. And we take the word of God and then we start applying that same way of thinking to it. But ultimately, what God is doing and what God is saying is the most important thing. I want to take that remote control thing a little bit farther. Um, uh, Chase shared it this morning at the first service and he shared it again. Um, it works the other way. You can actually turn the volume up, right? You know, I know how to turn Carolyn's volume up. I know how to be selfish and self-centered and I can get her volume up a little bit. Um, but... How do I get God's volume up? How do I get to a point where I'm in here at church today, or I'm, I'm, at, I'm at home watching from home, and, I, and Bob's up there, and he's going to do the best he can, but I don't need to hear from Bob today. I need to hear from God today. I need God to be louder than Bob is. And so how do I turn that up? Well, here's how. You just tell God, as long as I know it's you, I will adjust to anything you speak to me about this morning. That's the way to turn up God's volume. It actually works everywhere, not just when in a message. But as long as I know it's you, I will adjust to everything you share with me today, everything you show me today. So that's all I really have a heart for anyway. That's all I'm going to adjust to. I don't usually adjust to what people have to say. And, and even if it's really good stuff, that's all it really is, is really good stuff. But when God is speaking to me and I have a heart to adjust, it's amazing how clear it is and how... Um, just the just the knowledge that it, that I can accomplish it um, uh, is just so real. So I want it to be real for you today. Everything that you hear from God, you can do today. God will never tell you anything that can't happen. So open up your hearts to Him. Let Him speak to you. We're going to be going and talking about ramifications of responsibility. We've been in um, 14 weeks. This is our 13th week of this series. To next week will be our last in this one. How to light up your world. If this is your first time watching on TV or or here today, and you want to get more of them, they're online at graceconnect.com, and you can go watch the videos or listen to it on your way to work. I encourage you to do that. We've been learning about how to be a light in this world. You know, um, not too long ago, the whole world shut down, and now we're coming at, back out, and we're wondering if we're going to have to shut back down again, um, and we're going to keep close watch on that. If an epidemic starts hitting Johnstown and Milliken and people start getting sick, we'll probably have to cancel services, live services again for a while. Why? Because your health and your well-being is important to us. So those of you who are staying home because you're sick or staying home because you don't want to get sick or don't want to get someone else sick, you know, keep doing that. We want you to keep doing that. That's why we're doing uh, the videos. Um, we, you know, fortunate we've been doing that for over a year. God prepared us for this time by going out and getting our team all set up last November, which was before the first case of coronavirus was even known. And we began streaming our services live last um, November, and we, they've been going ever since. And so that the people that can't make it here can still be a part of what's going on. Why? Because it's not about being here. You can go to church every, every day, and if you walk out of here and you're not a light in the world that you touch, then you're of no value to the world that you touch. Okay? And that's true for me, too. I can preach a sermon, but if I don't go out and I don't allow God to use what he's doing and the things that we're going to be looking at today in my life, if I, in other words, say, okay, I know that I'm responsible to you for these things, but I'm not going to do them because these other things are more important, doesn't matter how many sermons I preach, I'm still, my life is still not going to matter etern from an eternal perspective. I'm not saying I can't go out and do good things. I can, but they are things that I will do myself. You're not a light in this world just because you do good things. You're a light in this world because God does something through you. And that can be um, bringing light to a bad situation and helping a person see that there's change that needs to happen in their life. It could be being a light in a a difficult situation and being an encouragement to somebody who's thinking about giving up on some, something that God wants them to do. 
Um, or it could just be an, encour an encouragement or an act of love. In other words, someone's feeling like nobody cares about them, but God wants them to know that he cares about them. And so in that moment when you say yes to God and he does something into their lives um, through you, through whether it be a word or a kind act or whatever, it's not coming from you, it's coming from God, which, which means it's eternal. It started, it began a long time ago, and there's been a process that finally got me to a point where I was able to let God do that through me and uh, Jesus um, is that process, obviously, and the scriptures speak of that process when it says for those of us who are saved that it is God who works in you to both will and to act according to his good purposes. Why? Because God has prepared and made us in Christ and created us a new creation in Christ, and he's, and he's got things he wants to accomplish through our lives, but those things don't get planned today. God had those things planned before we ever drew our first breath. But the key is responsibility do i have a responsibility to be a light in my world do i have a responsibility to be a light in my marriage do i have a responsibility to be a, a light in my friendships do i have um, a responsibility to be a light at work do i have a responsibility to be a light in my community and in my com in my country and i think most of us know the that the right answer would probably be yes i have a responsibility but i don't really spend a lot of time thinking about that and so today we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about that. Why do I have responsibility to be a light in the world that I live in? And we're going to look at the ramifications of that in today's message. And we're going to take it from Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Um, on your notes there, and this is Jesus right before he goes to be with the, with the Father in heaven. He's telling his disciples, and he's establishing the church, and he's basically saying this to them. Um, it says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In this paragraph, what we have is the responsibility of the church of each and every individual Christian, and then all of us together. Everything we do at Grace Community Church is to basically say to God, you have given us this responsibility, we are taking it seriously, we're going to be about meeting this responsibility. And so we're going to look at that today. Okay, So let's pray first. Father, I just thank you so much for your presence here. I pray for each person that you brought here today. I pray for every person that's watching online, those that will watch later on during the week. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts, that we'd turn the volume up, that we'd say to you in this moment, Lord, speak to me, because I will do, as long as I know it's you, I will adjust to anything you ask of me today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first thing on your notes there is, if I am going to accept this responsibility or even receive this responsibility, I must first be included. Write that down. I must first be included. Not everyone has this responsibility. Not everybody in this room has this responsibility because not everybody in this room is included. I'm not, I don't know which ones of you are and which ones of you aren't, but when I say this room, I also mean out there in TV land and those kinds of things. And what I'm talking about is, has, have I come into a relationship with God that God has included me in who he is? That God has included me not only in who he is, but what he does. Because if he has not, I have no responsibility. That's biblical. That's not just my opinion. That's biblical. Let's go to your notes there, Ephesians 1.13, where it says, You also were included in Christ. Circle the word included. Okay. The responsibility is for the people who meet the, what's the standard of this or whatever this passage is saying, right? You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, this is what you did, having believed you were marked in him by a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's what God did. So there's this moment in time where I hear the, the gospel or the message, the word of truth, I hear what I already know deep in my heart, but God puts it in the words. Bob, I love you. I want to have a 
close relationship with you. I want to be your God. I want you to walk with me. I want to do great things together with you, Bob. But your sin separates you from me, your selfishness. I want to include you in who I am, and you're just too selfish. Everyone's too selfish. My, my ideal, according to God, God's ideal is that he not only has created us, but he has created us to, to love him to the point where we can actually walk with him and be one with him. But, as the scriptures say, um, for all of us have sinned and fall short of God's glorious ideal. God wants that, but we all have sinned and fall short of that. And so then God says, but I still love you, Bob, and I still want to have this relationship with you. So I'm going to send my son. Because I love you, I'm going to send my son. And he's going to die and he's going to pay the penalty for your sin because the penalty for sin is death or separation from me. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And eternal life is not a ticket to heaven for eternity. Eternal life can be summed up in three things. Um, Number one, it's a free gift that I receive from God and only God. Jesus said, for all who, the Bible says, for all who receive Jesus, for all who call on his name, he gives them the power to become the children of God. So it's a gift. And it's a gift that I get by receiving it. I receive this gift. It is a full and meaningful life right now where Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. In other words, whatever we're going to be talking about today as I live these things out, this is how the scriptures say I live a full life. Okay, so I'm going to be sharing those things with you. And it's also living with Jesus for eternity. It is not going to heaven. It is being with Jesus wherever he is. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where you are or where I am, there you will be also. So now we can be with him and one with him as he puts his spirit in us. One day we will be in his physical presence and that will be a day that never ends. That is a day that has no beginning and has no end. From that moment on, we will be in his presence. Um, But are you included? It says you are. If you heard the message of your salvation, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed and put your faith in Jesus, then he marked you with the seal, his Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5 says this, and this is so important because we're, we're still, don't lose me here because this is a very common passage of scripture. It, the gospel, obviously, hopefully, has been something you've heard thousands of times, but have you ever looked at it from this, you've received something now, something is required of you. You've received something now, and to just sit there and just say, I got it, isn't enough. It isn't like a wedding ring. You give your your wife a wedding ring on the day and your husband on the day of your marriage, and they just carry that ring around them, and it really doesn't impact anything from that point on. No, this is a relationship, okay? This is where everything changes. So Romans 5, 5 on your note says, God has poured out his love to fill our hearts. He gave us his love, circle those two words, his love. He gave us his love through the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us. Again, you see this free gift, this giving, this giving, this... Nowhere does it say, I earned it. Nobody... Nowhere does it say, I deserved it. It just says, God has given it to me. And we just read, the reason he gave it to me is because I put my faith in Jesus and what he did for me. I'm not going to try to be good enough to be right with God. I know I can't be. And I'm going to put all my faith in Jesus, not only for my salvation so I can come into a relationship with God, but I'm going to put my faith in Jesus in order to live life in a way that pleases God. So I'm not going to try to do a bunch of good things to try to please God. I'm going to live life with Jesus because I know that pleases God. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's where it all comes together from responsibility. Remember, I must be included or it doesn't apply. If I just prayed a prayer so I could go to heaven and Jesus didn't put his spirit in me, I am not included. The prayer doesn't include me. God putting his spirit in me includes me, okay? Luke 12, 48 says, Much is required from those to whom much is given, for their responsibility is greater. I want you to think about what we've covered so far before we move on, because this is foundational. If this is not true, nothing I say for the rest of this message applies to you yet. But you can make this true by receiving God's free gift of eternal life, by rejecting your, your selfishness and turning to God and, and admitting that you need him and that you want him, and then you do what he did for you. He gave himself for you. You give yourself entirely to him. If you do that, then you receive his love. When you receive his spirit. So much is required from those whom much is given. I want you to circle the word much. 
Okay, then I want you to go back to the previous verse and I want you to circle his love. It's there twice. Circle it again. If I am going to define that word much, right, in Luke 12, 48, if somebody were to ask me, Bob, what's the most God could give me? What is the most God could give me? God's all powerful, so he could give me his power. God's all knowing, so he could give me his knowledge. God is just, so he could give me a sense of just, God is justice. God is merciful, so he could give me his mercy. God is love, and God could give me his love. Of all of these things, the only one that the scriptures defines God by, the rest are attributes of God, but love is God. God is love. Okay, so we're talking about a love that a human cannot have and t- that is different than your love and my love. And we know that anytime we try to love someone that's unlovable in our own strength, we can't do it. But then all of a sudden, because we allow God's love to flow through us, we love them as much as we love our own children because it's not our love, but His love for them that we're experiencing. And so this is that whole, I have to be included thing, because if I'm included, I have been given much. I have been given God's love. And now, because according to this scripture here in Luke, Jesus is saying, much is required of you, Bob, because now much has been given to you. Your your responsibility to me is greater because I poured my love into your heart. This is why pastors beat their head against the wall. They're trying to bring people who aren't, have never received God's love to a point where they're sharing God's love. I think it's just better for me to speak Take the hit and get you to think about, are you really, have you really received the love of God? Because if not, you're not saved. John says it in 1 John. 40 years of the church has gone by. He's writing 1 John at the end of the the Bible there. And he says this, we have man's testimony, what man has to say, but God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony of God. And he says, and this is the testimony. God has given us life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has this life. He who does not have the son of God does not have this life. I'm writing to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, he's talking to the church. And he's talking to everybody who believes in the name of the son of God. And he's saying to the ones who believe, if you have him, if you've been included, you are saved. If you don't have him, You have not yet been included. It's time to be included. Foundation. Foundation. Everything you have. If you have not been included in Christ. If God has not poured his love into your heart. Whether you're out there in TV land or right here today. Standing on this stage right here. If I have not done that. Then I am not included. If his spirit has not come into my life, then his love has not come into my life. But if his spirit has, then his love has. I have received much, and now much is required. And that's where we're going to go. The first thing, if I'm included, after I'm included, is i got to learn something that isn't taught very much in the American church. You know what's taught in the American church? You need to be good. You need to do better. Do you know what needs to be taught in the American church? Number two, I must learn to follow Jesus. Not rules, not people. I must learn to follow Jesus. You want the rules, the Bible's got them, but you're not to follow them. Jesus said to the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they had the first five books memorized, and they prided themselves on keeping the rules. And he said to them, you search the scriptures for eternal life, but the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me and receive this life. The only value of this word and the only value of my life and your life to each other is our ability to point each other to Jesus. Amen. If you got some superstars in your life that are more important to you than Jesus, it's time to rethink that. And we'll get into that in just a moment. I'm not following them. I'm following Jesus. John 8, 12, on your notes there. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, circle those two words, follows me. Whoever follows me will never, circle the word never, walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
Do you know what it's like to walk in darkness? We all know what it's like to walk in darkness. It's when I'm in a scary situation and I'm afraid. It's when I'm losing my job and I'm, and I'm worried and I'm concerned. It's when my, life, my wife or my spouse decides to go and live with someone else and leave me and I feel like my whole world is falling apart. That's what living in darkness is all about. It's, it's, it's as simple as having an argument with my teenager and, I, and, and I, all I see them is, and I'm driving them away when all I'm trying to do is bring them close are together i'm living in darkness how do i live in light during that time well i need to follow jesus in that situation i need to follow him and if you haven't learned to do that you need to learn to do that why because you're always going to have to the darkness in this world isn't going anywhere and we're going to be impacted by it for the rest of our lives And we're either going to follow Jesus in the midst of the situations we're facing or we're not. But according to Jesus, here's a promise he makes. But you got to be included, right? So, But you also got to follow because he says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Yes, your spouse is leaving, but you will not be in darkness. Yes, you got an army against you, but you will not be afraid because you will not be in darkness. Why? Because perfect love drives out fear. And Jesus is perfect love. And when I'm following him, I'm like David facing Goliath. But when I'm not, when I don't know he's there, when I don't know the battle is his, I'm just there with him, then the fear and the darkness comes in. Luke 14, 26 on your notes, anyone who wants to be my follower, circle those two words, my follower. Jesus owns us. When we follow him, not when we follow a pastor, not when we follow what's in a book, not when we follow our, ourselves, anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than he does his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters. Yes, more than his own life. Otherwise, he cannot be my disciple. If I could change one thing about my life and your life, it would be this. That when we walked out of this door, we would not love our families less. But that we would never love Jesus less than we love our families. Do you follow what I just said? Because this is the way we think. And this is what Satan says. Bob's telling you, or not Bob in this case. Jesus is telling you. Because Jesus is saying these things. Jesus is saying to you, you have to love your wife less. That isn't what he's saying. He's saying, how about this? How about this? Love your wife twice as much as you do and then love me more. Why can't I read that and see that in it? Because that's what he's saying. That's all he's saying. Why? Because as soon as I do, whether I only love my wife this much, but she's the one I love more than anyone else, if I will love him more this much, then I will learn how to love my wife that much. And then as I do, I can learn to love him more, and then I will learn to love my wife that much. The more I love the Lord, the more I love others. There is no other truer statement than that. The more I love the Lord, the more I love others in the moment and as a whole. Okay? So can you see, before I start getting into the responsibilities that we're about to cover, I must be included. I must be someone that Jesus is actually saying, I have authority. And that's what he means by that. He's he's not saying, he's not lifting himself up there. He's saying, Bob, you're going to go through life. And you're going to have other people in your life that you're, that you're going to listen to. And you're going to adjust to, as you should. But if they ever contradict me, don't ever forget what I started this whole thing out with. Before I got into your responsibilities, I told you, Bob, all authority on heaven and on earth belong to me. So as long as you know it's me, you do what I ask you to do. Even if your wife or your husband doesn't want you to. Even if it means your kids will go hungry. You do what I tell you to do. More Christians have said no to God because they felt God was telling them to hurt someone they loved. Or what God was asking them would hurt somebody they loved. And in that moment, all that was really happening was God was testing your love. And remember the story of Abraham? Some of you don't. But Abraham didn't have a child, and him and Sarah didn't have a child and his wife to the point where Sarah 
gave, her, gave him her, one of her servants and said, here, marry her so that you can have this child and God can keep this promise to you, right? Well, so he has the child, but that isn't the promise. God says, people don't keep my promises. I keep my promises. And then God gives, finally gives Abraham, he's 99 years old, and gives him that, that child, Isaac. And he says to him, I'm going to do great things through him and I'm going to populate the world through your seed, through this person. But then God says, I want you to go up and I want you to take him up to the mountain when he's about 12 or 13. He says, I want you to go up to the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him. For no other reason than that's what I want. And so Abraham doesn't tell his wife what he's doing. He goes up there and he, he builds an altar and his son goes, you know, Father, where's the lamb? And he, he says, the God will provide one. And he takes his son, ties him up, puts him on that altar. And of course, before he lights it, he's going to kill him. And he takes the knife and he's about to kill him. And God says, Abraham, don't do it. Stop. I see that your faith is good and then there was a lamb, a ram caught in a bush next to him and they brought the ram over there's only one reason for that god was showing us that there that one of the the things that we're going to we're going to call our faith in god faith but we're going to tell him no if we think it's going to cost us someone we love more than god so the things I'm talking about are not easy. If I'm not included, and I don't know God's goodness until I am, I don't know how, how God, he, like, like God knows. God can fix anything. According to the New Testament, Abraham knew that God could make the living rise again. Abraham just trusted God. But how many times do we not because we don't do this? And that's why we need to follow Jesus. He will always move us towards the Father's will for us. And so when he wants us to forgive somebody, we will. But we'll need his help. We'll need to love him more than we love the person who is hurting us. So anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than he does his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, or sisters. Yes, more than his own life. Otherwise, he cannot be my disciple. Now I want to go back to the responsibilities. But I can't do what's next if I'm not included in God and if I'm not willing to follow Jesus, okay? So, so what is next? Well, it's the next thing in that passage. All authority in heaven and earth has been, Jesus is saying, has been given to him. So now I'm going to give you your responsibilities. Number three says, I must seek out others who want to be included. I'm included. I'm following Jesus. Whether I like it or not, he's reaching other people. If he brought you here today, it's no surprise to me I live to see this. I live to see God bring you. If you're online today, put in a, a text. You know, do a comment. Let us know you're there. I knew you were coming. I didn't know it was you, but I knew you were coming. Why? Because this is what my father does. He doesn't do it because I want him to do it. He does it because he, it's what he does, and I live my life to join him, as does this church. And so we were expecting you today, every one of you. Okay, so you're going, why? Because of this truth that I've been included and I'm following Jesus and, I, and the one I'm following says, I love the, each person that I draw. Jesus said this, no one can come to me unless my father draws him. And everyone who comes to me, I will never turn away. Anyone who follows Jesus knows this. You don't pick and choose. I don't pick and choose. Why? Because God doesn't. God draws, and people come, and all who come, Jesus will not turn away. So that's Matthew 28, verses 19. The, the, the verses that are in red are all going back to that first uh, verses, the paragraph I read at the beginning. We have all authority on heaven and earth have been given to Jesus, and then he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Now listen to me. We have responsibilities, and in each one of these next two, th three things, there's a total of three right here, each one, we have responsibility to God that impacts, impacts a first a large group and then a smaller group and then a smaller group. I do not have three responsibilities for everyone. I have three responsibilities. The first one is for everyone. I have the responsibility to help people who want to find Jesus find Jesus. That's everyone. 
Okay, I have that responsibility. I'm supposed to go and make disciples. I want you to circle the word disciples because it does not say believers. Believers who truly believe are going to heaven if they've been marked with the Spirit. But if, you choose not, if you've been included but do not follow, then you will not bear fruit. In other words, your life will not matter for eternity. It will matter here, and it does every single day. But it won't matter in eternity. What you do here won't matter in eternity. Not that what you do there will matter, but what you do here and now will not matter in eternity if you're not a disciple. And we'll see that as we go through. Jesus says it in Luke 14, 33. He says, in the same way, he's just not got done saying, hey, before you start following, you need to take a look and realize it's going to cost you everything to follow me, right? You got to love me more than even you love yourself. You got to love me more than your wife and your husband or your children, He says, in the same way, concluded Jesus, none of you can be my disciple unless you give up everything you have. I don't need to give up my wife and I don't need to give up my house necessarily. But if if God is telling me to do something, that means my wife is going to be unhappy with me, even lead me. And I know it's him. I need to do it. I need to love him more than her. And the same thing with my house. If God says, you know, you lost your job, don't hold on to the house, love me more. And then the fact that you're losing the house won't cause you so much pain. Just love me more, walk with me. You're just going to walk through, with me through a valley instead of through a mountainside. You're going to walk through, you'll be a light to the people around you while you're losing your house or losing your spouse instead of darkness, instead of letting the darkness consume you. 1 Corinthians 9, 22 says, yes, whatever a person like, this is Paul saying, all right, I'm going to take on this responsibility to go out and make disciples, knowing that, If I'm going to make a disciple, I can only make a disciple out of someone who wants to give Jesus everything because Jesus says, unless I'm willing to give Jesus everything, they can't be his disciple if they're not willing to do that. So he goes, so how am I going to approach this? So he goes, this is what I'm going to do. I got a strategy. He says, whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. Our first responsibility is to the whole world. And what we're supposed to do is, I've been included. I'm following Jesus. Jesus wants to include you. And I'm looking to see who wants Jesus to include them. And I make them a disciple. I introduce them to Jesus. I help them see the difference between believing that he's out there to actually being willing to follow him so that they can be his disciple. So I have a responsibility to make people disciple, and the people I'm drawing from are all nations, or everybody. And then we get to the next one, which is number four, I must include them in the fellowship. I want to define the them before I talk about the fellowship. Who do I need to include in the fellowship? Well, remember we started with the whole world, and with the whole world we make disciples. I don't make the whole world, I can't allow the whole world to come into fellowship with me because I don't do it. God does it. And for you to be in fellowship with me and me to be in fellowship with you, we have to be in fellowship with God. If I break my fellowship with God, I'm still saved, you're still saved, but I can't have fellowship with you. We can be friends and we can tell each other what we want to hear and everything like that. And we can have all kinds of conversations that don't bring glory to God. But what we can't do together is join God because I am refusing to. And fellowship, the key about fellowship is being together because we're together with Christ. That's why he said, whenever two or more of you are gathered in my name, there I am also. So this whole idea of fellowship is that I want, God wants to include you. If you're here today and you've never had Jesus come into your life, he wants to include you. And he wants me to teach you and others here to teach you how to follow Jesus. And then as you do, he wants you to begin to love me and love others the way Jesus loves you. And that's genuine fellowship. Matthew 28, 19 says, goes on to say, you know, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the, in other words, including them as a family in who you are. So we baptize with water, and Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about that. And we baptize with water, but in that moment, what are we doing? We're saying, you're a disciple. You've decided to follow Jesus. We're disciples. We've decided to follow Jesus. We are one. 
You are one with Christ. I am one with Christ. That means we are one with each other. Do you remember, go read chapter 17 of John and Jesus' prayer to his father when he not only prayed for his 12 that were following him, he prayed for all who would believe through their message, which would be us. And he prayed that we would be one as he and the father are one. That's fellowship. It comes back to you're included, I'm included. You're following Jesus, I'm following Jesus. We're family. We take care of each other. And we'll do more than that. But ultimately, before I can begin to grow in a family, I must belong to that family. And they must belong to me. In Galatians 3, 26 through 28, we're going to see this baptism of Jesus. It says, now we are all, it's up here, not on your notes. Now we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Every one of us. Had nothing to do with what church we went to when we, or even if we were going to church. If we were adopted by God, he put his spirit in us, we are all children of God through faith in Jesus, and we who have been baptized into union with Christ are enveloped by him. Not by water, but by him. We are baptized into union with Christ when we heard the message of our salvation, having believed and put our faith in him, and he put his spirit in us. That's this baptism that Paul's talking about. He says, we are no longer Jews or Gentiles or slaves or free men or even merely men and women, but we are all the same. We are Christians. We are one in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? So, Grace Community Church, I don't care what church you walked in from or if you never walked into from a, a church at all, it doesn't matter. We want you to be included in Christ. We want you to be a part of the family. The way to do that is to be adopted for all who receive him, for all who call in his name. Jesus gives them the power to become the children of God. We want you to be united with Christ. We want to teach you and we want you to let God help use you to help us learn how to better follow Jesus. Why? Because we're family and it's what we do. We follow Jesus. We don't go around thinking we're better than other people. We don't go around, you know, doing th everything we want to to try to impress God or press, impress others. We are family and we follow Jesus. And no one, no one gets to say I'm better than you. No one who's following Jesus would ever think it because as soon as you start thinking you're better than somebody, you're not following Jesus anymore. Because his opinion would differ every single time. Right? And so this fellowship, this family, this sense of we all belong together, we lose it. Oh, you don't go to my church, so I don't need to love you as much. Are you kidding me? Absolutely we do. But we won't unless we're following the Lord. Acts 2.42 says they spent their time learning from the apostles. And anytime somebody is teaching you from the New Testament, you are learning from the apostles, Right? They spent their time learning from the apostles and they were like family to each other. They also broke bread and prayed together. This is family. This is fellowship. This is for all of us. 1 John 1, 3 says, We are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. So we're looking at 1 John 1. Remember, John wrote this like 40 years and John, after, after the church began. And he's saying, let me tell you why I say the things to you that I say. Let me tell you why I share with you what God does through us. Okay? He says, we are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. And here's why we're telling you this. So that you may share the fellowship and the joys that we have with the Father and with Jesus Christ, his Son. Not so that you can be a part of our church or a member of our church and we can say, look how many people we got coming to our church. We share these things with you so that you can share in the fellowship of God. And if we have another motive, shame on us. There should be no other reason why we do that. None. So that you can share in the fellowship. Which is very important when we go to the next one. So I must seek out others who want to be included. And I must make them disciples. Tell them the difference between believing and following. Because a disciple gives up everything to follow. And then I teach them. As I'm teaching them that. I must include them in the fellowship. They are a part of me. Good, bad, indifferent. No matter what choices they make. 
They are mine, and I'm to join God in their lives the way that God uses others in mine. And that's where five comes in, the third responsibility that God gives us for each other. I must help others grow spiritually. Because I have received much, because I have the love of God filling my heart, I have a responsibility to include others who want to be included and to embrace them in the family and to teach them to obey because only as we obey do we really grow spiritually. No one ever grew spiritually by reading a book. But when I begin to apply the word of God, if that's what the book I'm reading, then I learn. Jesus said, remember, if you hold to my teachings, then you are truly my disciples. Not if you read my teachings, not if you memorize my teachings, not if you teach my teachings, but if you hold to my teachings, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we're not here to teach you right and wrong. We're here to help one another hold to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I can sum up everything Jesus commanded us with three commandments. Jesus summed up everything in the Old Testament when he said, All of the law and all of the prophets are summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. So we got all the Old Testament covered in that. So what about the rest? Because obviously the commandments of Jesus go beyond this. And Jesus said this, a new command I give you. It's the only one he gave. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. That you follow me by your love one for another. And so in the church, we have this greater love. Jesus has given us his love so that we can love with that love each other. And as we love each other, we help each other grow. And each one of us are, are made differently and gifted differently. But it's as each one of us does the part that God wants us to do in the body, the whole body grows. So it's very important that you discover who you are. Grace Community Church, everything we do here, none of it is accidental. Everything is so that we can live out the message you are hearing today. One-on-one class. What does the Bible say God wants when he's talking about fellowship with him? What it means to be saved and have fellowship with him? And what is he talking about when he said he wants us to have fellowship with each other? That's 101. 201. What are the habits necessary that actually put the Bible into practice so that I can begin to grow spiritually? 301, how am I shaped for service? Because as I let God use me the way he made me and when he wants to use me and how he wants to use me, only then is the eternal happening. If I'm just doing what I want to do when I want to do it, it's not eternal. In fact, you can bet on it. I can tell you everything I've done as a pastor that will not follow me to heaven. And the only way I, I can define it is I knew I had another reason for doing it. Maybe I wanted to fix a problem and I wanted things better in the church. And so I just went out and did something. That is, and it was good. It was biblical. Don't get me wrong. But it wasn't the Lord leading me. Which we'll see in a minute how important that is. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of God dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. It doesn't say go out and get a really good Bible and teach one another. It says let the Bible dwell in you so richly that now you can teach people. You can teach others. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 11 says, for God will make you more and more seed to plant. So God will make you more and more seed. He'll put more into your life and he will make it grow. We don't make it grow. God makes it grow as we join Jesus in each other's lives. He will make it grow so that you can give away more and more fruit from your harvest. In other words, the, you're giving away what God is giving you. He has deposited much. Much is required. And you are giving it. And he is giving you more. You are being faithful. And this is why it's so important. 
Um, that growing spiritually is just simply being more faithful to the things we're talking about today, being more faithful to live out your responsibility to help others who want to know Jesus come to know him, to help others who are part of the family to embrace them and love them the way Jesus loves you, and to teach each other to grow and to uh, do the things that God made you to do. 301 class, how am I shaped? How does God want to use me? And then 401 class, how do I use my whole network to do everything better and to have more opportunity God has put people in my life to help me become more effective at keeping these responsibilities. Which brings us to number six. Knowing all these things isn't enough. Number six, I must let Jesus lead the way. Remember, he said that all authority in heaven and earth was his. And then he says, go do this, this, and this. And we, and we think, well, he wants us to go this, this, and this. And we kind of like forget what comes right after that. And it's right there on your notes in red where he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what he's saying to us is, I'm your authority. I want you to go out and make disciples of all nations. Not believers, disciples. I want you to embrace them in the fellowship. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Include them in what we are doing. Then I want you to teach them to obey and teach each other to obey everything that I have commanded you so that you might grow spiritually. Amen. But listen to me. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you when, when you do that, people hate you. I am with you when you do that, people reward you and embrace you. I am with you. It is not you. It is me. Don't forget, I am with you. If you're doing it alone, then I'm not with you. If I'm not in it, you shouldn't be. And if you don't know if I'm in it, ask. Does any of you la- remember you're supposed, to, you're supposed to let the word of God indwell in you richly and then, and then it, uh, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom? Je- and the word of God says, do you lack wisdom? Ask God and he will give it to you. Right? Why? Because... We're just living out our responsibility. We're not doing church. We're living out our responsibility. Much has been given. The love of God has been given to us. And that love of God pours out to the whole world to come to know him. But those who don't want him, we, are not, we have no more obligation to. But those who do, we have an obligation to help them find Jesus. And then we have an option, I mean, obligation to help them follow Jesus as we follow Jesus together. It says, surely I am with you always. And then anyone who's been through Master Life, which again, Master Life teaches you everything that we're learning today. It's, I chose it for a reason because it, it, it actually walks us in, puts in practice in a small group everything I've learned uh, that we've been learning today. He says, Jesus says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. So even though I got all the responsibilities that I understand them all, but I do it on my own, it accomplishes nothing. I need to remember that Jesus is with me, and if he's with me, he's probably the one that needs to lead. Amen? Amen. And then number seven is I must remain faithful. I don't know if you've quit and you've given up on these responsibilities and you're just doing church. But I hope you'll just quit on church and start doing these responsibilities again. Okay? If your life doesn't look like what we've been talking about, I want you to go to God and I want you to tell him, I'm sorry, let's start today. I want to go out into all the world and I want to make disciples. I want to be one first. I want to be included and I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to learn to follow you. I want to help others find you. I want to help other people follow you. I want to continue to do it. And no matter what happens, I don't ever want to quit. Maybe you have quit and you just need to say, God, I'm sorry. For if you're faithful to confess your sins, God is faithful to cleanse you and forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The reason that he does that is so that we can get up and start meeting these responsibilities again as we follow Jesus. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2 says, Those who are trusted with something valuable must, circle the word must, show they are worthy of that trust. I don't know if anybody's ever explained to you the responsibilities that you have because God has poured his love into your heart, but I've explained them to you today. 
And there is nothing more valuable that God can give you than his love in this world. Those who are trusted with something valuable must show they are worthy of that trust. And to be worthy of that trust, I simply deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Jesus every day. And all the acts that are supposed to happen will happen as I say, yes, Lord. And I join the Lord, and you do that. And here's what Jesus is looking for at the end of it all. Matthew 25, 23, he says, The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. We're all going to be standing before the Lord one day, and he wants to say this to each one of us. And he wants to say, I gave you my love, and you used it. When that person hurts you and instead of harming them and treating them badly, you love them. I gave you my love and you used it when you saw someone who didn't know me and they were going through a bad situation. And instead of just saying, I'll pray for you, you led them to me and you shared with them how I help you when you're in that kind of a situation because you wanted them to come to know me so they can have what I've given you so that they can have my love poured into their life the way I've poured it in to yours. You took the time to learn to follow me because you wanted to and you desired me. And it was those moments where you didn't want to go to that Bible study, but you knew I wanted you to and you did. Those times you wanted to close your Bible because you were tired and go to sleep, but you kept reading because I wasn't done talking. Those little things you were faithful in so that you could stay responsible Now let's spend eternity. i got so much more for you. I've got so much more for you. Now let me show you the big things that we're going to do together. I want you to stand before Jesus that day. And I want you to remember today. And I want you to say one thing. Thank you, Jesus, that you spoke to me. Thank you that you shared those things with me. Thank you for all the things you said to me that day. Bob did the best he could, but he was just Bob. Thank you for what you showed me. And thank you for helping me say yes, Lord, so that I could live the life in this, while I was on this earth that now allows me to receive all these things you want me to have. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for each person's here. They're so precious to you, each person that's out there watching. Lord, I know you're going to keep working in that. As long as we're faithful and we'll keep working with you, You know, we'll still see you moving in our lives and the lives of people around us. We lift up our families to you and pray that we could be a better light to them than what we've been. We lift up our neighbors to you and pray, Father, that we at least love them the way that we love ourselves and that you would give us opportunities to demonstrate that and find the common ground with them that we can so that we might, hopefully they might let us tell them about you and let you save them. I thank you for each person that you add to the body. I thank, for, I thank you for um, this past week, you know, uh, you, the people that you saved. You reach out today in greater ways and more often than you did when you were limited to that body that you had while you walked this earth. Now you are only limited by our willingness to say, yes, Lord, we will live responsibly. You have given us these responsibilities and we will join you in this world and we will help others to be included in you. We'll help others learn to follow you. We'll help each other grow in a family of love that lets your love flow freely. We'll help each other through service to grow spiritually. And Lord God, we will just let you lead the way as a church and as individuals. Please bless each person here with you. Continue to pour out your love into our hearts so that we don't make the mistake of loving with our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Bob. All right, during this next song, if you want to fill out your communication cards.